if you studied physics, you've probably been taught that protons are composed of three quarks. Well, that's not the truth. And today I'd like to discuss how proton properties are quantum field effects. And to begin with, given that we have a quantum field that's made of particle pair dipoles, and we know the field is made of dipoles because of the Casimir effect, which requires van der Waals forces. I talk about that in many other videos, so I won't in this one. And that means that around a proton, there's always going to be polarized dipoles in space. And we also know from scattering experiments that a proton behaves like it has a shell of polarized dipoles at its charge radius. And that's what we scatter off of, or what particles and light scatter off of when they scatter off a proton. And Feynman came up with the term partons. He thought they had to be tens of thousands of little things that were being scattered off of to account for proton scattering. And now the prevailing theory is that what it's scattering off of is a shell of quantum fluctuations. Well, the important thing is we can account for all of the proton properties just from this shell alone. We don't need to introduce quarks to account for the shell. And I'll go through that. Now, another key experimental piece of evidence is if you look at the charge distribution within the proton itself, that's been measured as well, where we have essentially a zero charge at the center, the charge increases out to the charge radius, and then it starts to decrease. We get the expected inverse square law of being reduction in the charge with distance once it's outside the charge radius. And this is interesting because it, it's not linear up here, so it doesn't show the charge or originating at the center. It shows the charge originating at the charge radius. And so what it looks like is that we have a point like polarizer that doesn't even have charge in the middle. And as it polarizes the quantum field, the charge magnitude increases until you get to the charge radius, and then outside of that, it starts to decrease. And so this gives us a picture of what the structure might look like, that we might have some sort of bare proton in the middle surrounded by a shell of quantum fluctuations. Now, if we look at Coulomb's law, where we have the charge is the surface integral of the flux of polarization dot dA, the surface area of the surface around the charge. So you basically have a, a charge in the middle with the amount of charge, and then you have an area around it. And any area around it you choose in order for it to be the inverse square law has to give you the same amount of charge inside. Well, this has been interpreted normally as the flux of polarization depends on the amount of charge. Well, in quantum field theory, where you start with a field filled with dipoles, the flux of polarization is due to the resistance to polarization of those dipoles. So instead of the amount of charge being caused by some amount of charge that's being been added to the particle somehow, the amount of charge is due to the polarization of the field, the polarizability of the quantum field. It's the quantum field that determines the charge, not the polarizer in the middle. And so in that way, the spherical shell of quantum fluctuations determines the charge by its own nature of how easily polarized it is. 
it's not a matter of the charge originating from within. So the bare proton in the middle doesn't have charge. It doesn't have a magnitude charge. But it does have the ability to polarize these electric dipoles. And these electric dipoles don't have to have charge either. They just have to have the ability to be polarized. And then next, we have to consider the rotation. Polarization, by its very nature, is the rotation of dipoles. You have a charge in space and a dipole, and the dipole will rotate so that it keeps its orientation with respect to the charge. And if you have two, say you have a charge here and you have two dipoles, if they are tending to orient in opposite directions, so they start here and then they would go together, that causes two like charges to move together. And the opposite happens if it's the other way. Uh, if you end up with two dipoles having to go this way, then like charges move together. And that requires energy. Or, in some cases, you may have to have the whole dipole move, which takes energy. It takes far less energy if all the dipoles rotate together around the point charge. So because of that, when this is polarized and all these dipoles are rotating, it induces an inherent spin around the proton, that they tend to rotate all together around a shell type structure of quantum fluctuations. And that's where spin comes from. And not only does that where spin come from, that's where we get magnetic moment. The magnetic moment of a proton is equal to two times the electric charge times the speed of light times the radius of the proton, the charge radius, divided by four pi, a geometric term. And in this case, 2 is called the g-factor. And the g-factor is 2 because we're dealing with two charges. We have positive charges rotating one way, negative charges rotating the other way, which doubles the magnetic moment. And if you know basic physics, classical magnetic moment is charge times the radius times the velocity. That's where you get magnetic moment, this term. And you may also know if you've studied physics that the g-factor for the proton is much larger than 2 instead of being close to 2. And the reason for that is that in the standard equation they're using the mass of the proton which would be converted to the Compton radius of the proton, which is the wrong radius. The Compton radius does not equal the charge radius. If you use the proton's real radius, the charge radius, you end up with a g-factor that's approximately 2. Now there are some correction terms of that, so it's not quite 2, but it's close. And so this quantum field structure gives us the magnetic moment in addition to the spin. And also note that the limit is the speed of light. So this is spinning effectively the rotation of each individual quantum fluctuation makes it appear that there's a shell rotating at the speed of light. That's what it's approximating. And because it's rotating at the speed of light, that's limiting. It can't rotate faster than that. It, you can't get polarization faster than that. So that prevents the structure of quantum fluctuations from getting any larger. Because if it is larger, the tip speed of this rotation would exceed the speed of light. So it causes a break in structure. We have a certain type of polarization happening close to the bare proton until we get to the outer shell when we reach the speed of light limit 
it can no longer grow in the same way. It breaks down. And that's when we start seeing the reduction in the polarization, which is the reduction in the charge. Uh, not the char central charge, but the charge distribution outward, locally. So, the actual limit itself, the size of the quantum fluctuation, is a quantum fluctuation effect due to the speed of light limit. Then next we have a phenomena of the mass. If we take, if we treat this spherical shell as a casimir cavity, then a wavelength of a quantum fluctuation that has a distance, a wavelength equal to the diameter of the shell will not be able to exist there. And what we find if we do the math is if you measure the amount of quantum energy, zero point energy, being excluded by this proton shell, it equals the mass of the proton. The proton mass is not due to some elves or fairies adding it to it. It doesn't come from quarks in the middle that are moving relativistically. It is just a matter of how much quantum field energy is being displaced by this shell-like structure of quantum fluctuations around the proton. That's where mass comes from. There's no magic to it. You don't, you don't have to add up masses of different particles that are rotating in some scientifically impossible relativistic orbit. So that gives us our basic properties. Not only does the spherical shell explain our scattering and the charge distribution, it explains the charge magnitude and it explains the mass, spin, magnetic moment, it explains the radius. And then lastly, it also explains the matter antimatter property because these dipoles are proton antiproton dipoles that form because not only do they end up being polarized with respect to the electric charge, they're also polarized with respect to matter antimatter orientation. And this is something I discuss in other papers. I'll have to go into detail. Uh, I'll link a couple below. And so not only do we get all these other properties, we get the any amount of matter or any matter around the proton. In the case of proton matter, any proton would be any matter. So we get that in, as well in the list of properties. So none of these properties, charge, mass, magnetic moment, spin, its radius, its scattering, its charge distribution, all of that can be accounted with the spherical structure of the proton, the spherical shell structure of quantum fluctuations around the bare proton. And all the bare proton in the middle has to do is polarize those quantum fluctuations with respect to electric charge, and matter and antimatter polarity. That's all there is to it. Once you have a free bare proton in the quantum field, the quantum field does the rest. There's no need to do, to have anything else in order to account for the properties of the quantum field. Now, I did a previous video on the electron. The electron is exactly the same way, except that it ends up with a shell structure at its Compton radius, where its diameter is equal to the Compton wavelength. And that happens because the rate of polarization for 
a negative charge that's matter is different than the rate of polarization for a positive charge that's matter. Uh, and I wrote a little paper on that, and I'll also link below. So anyway, now you know where the proton properties come from, and you know why you don't need to have quarks. So I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you did, please like, share, and subscribe. Be sure to share it with your physicist friends, I know they'll enjoy it. And then I have papers I've linked below on all these uh, factors. I discuss it in greater detail in my book, Goodbye Quarks, the Ionian Theory. And I also discuss uh, my quantum th field theory research in my other books, The Zero Point Universe and The 100 Day Slides in Physics. And I'm a retired independent researcher. I'm still doing some research and these videos, of course. And if you buy one of my books, that helps support me in, in my retirement. And I also have a Patreon account that also helps. So if you'd like to support me, I'd really appreciate it. And so I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope you learned a lot.